from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Our topic for the next two weeks is going to be Indian law and the history of uh, Indian tribes and the law under which they are governed. This is a very complex issue. We want to talk about the relationship tribes have with the federal government and the relationships that those tribes have with the states in which they're located, and also relationships between tribes. Uh, this is complicated, as I indicated, and we'll be looking at a lot of structure and a lot of policies and a lot of law. And we're very, very fortunate to have with us a guest who is very qualified to address our subject. We're very pleased to welcome to today's program, and again next week, Tara Salisbury Allgood. She holds a baccalaureate degree from the University of San Diego in the field of political science. Her doctorate of jurisprudence is from the American University College of Law in Washington, D.C. Tara, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure having you here, and you and I have talked ahead of time, and we look forward to this two-week series. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm very pleased to have our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who also is an attorney in the state of Idaho, and she'll be highly uh, qualified to deal with the subject today. She is on other subjects, and I will now at this time invite Janelle to commence the questioning on Indian law and history. Tara, it's going to be very interesting today to talk about this subject. Uh, Indian law is a specialty, a, a special area of the law. And, but there are a good number of people who are watching this program that I'm sure have some interest in it, and it does affect a lot of lives, particularly in our area, uh, even if one is not involved directly with a tribe. Um, can you tell us a little bit for a matter of background as to how many tribes there are and where tribes are located, and then some of the tribes that are local here in our area? All right. Uh, there are 557 recognized tribes uh, in the United States, of which about 227 are within Alaska and then the remainder are located within, the 30, within 34 states in, in the United States. Um, as far as the uh, area tribes, we have several area tribes, five actually within the state of Idaho, Nez Perce, Coeur d'Alene, Kootenays, um, Chopais, and, and Shoshone Bannocks. And there are some in our neighboring state of Washington, too, that are close by. Uh, what are some of the tribes that are over there? Well. In, the, in, in this particular area, the Spokane tribe, Kalispells, Colville, um, I believe there are about 26 to 28 tribes in Washington that are federally recognized. And some in Montana as well, too. Yes. So there are a lot of tribes right around the area. Um, what is the relationship, just, to, just a general differences between tribes? What are the relationships between tribes like? All 557 tribes are individually diverse. Uh, they are culturally, ethnically, and linguistically different. They all represent sovereign nations, and so they all have different characteristics that started thousands of years ago and lead us to where we are to get today. Politically, uh, like I said, culturally, they're, they're all different. They all have different backgrounds. Some of them are more related to one another than, than others. Some of them are related to area tribes. Some of them have history with one another. Uh, a lot of tribal members are members of, um, have blood from several area tribes or several tribes. And so they're all very, very different, very distinct, very uh, politically distinct, and they're sovereign. Another area that uh, covers what we're talking about, Indian law in general, uh, over time as the United States became a a nation state itself through uh, the adoption of the Articles of Confederation and then the United States Constitution. Uh, during that time and somewhat before and after, certainly, there has been a lot of uh, agreements, and we talk about these oftentimes in the form of treaties between tribes and the government of the United States. Could you give us just some general background historically about what that kind of relationship is, and is there a specific agreement each tribe has with the U.S. government? The, the very general background, obviously it's, it's very diverse and, yeah. and long, but the general background is within the United States Constitution under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, it gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations, with the states, 
and with every individual Indian tribe. So it treats every, every tribe as distinct and sovereign. Um, in addition, in the United States Constitution, um, there are two other places that, that are used to govern Indian law. One is the property clause, and one is Article II, Section Two of the Constitution that um, governs treaty making. As far as individual agreements with tribes, a lot of um, a lot of use of the word treaty is is used to govern all agreements, even though they're not specifically treaties by definition. Can I interrupt and say sure. that in addition to actual signed treaties, there's also sometimes executive agreements that hasn't yes. the president. I know right. the Coraline tribe has some interest in his. Right. Uh, the way it works is that for several years under Article II, Section 2 of the Constitution, treaties were agreements between the United States and the tribe. In 1871, uh, an end to treaty making was had by the Congress. They, they said no more treaties. So after that time, and sometimes even before, uh, the president took, took on that relationship by himself or with the, with the implied consent um, of Congress, but in the form of executive orders. So agreements with tribes came in the form of treaties, executive orders, and then some, some other just agreements. So there, it's very diverse, and it varies from tribe to tribe. The Coeur d'Alene tribe is an exec, what's called an executive order tribe, um, meaning it doesn't have a, a, quote, treaty, but it does have an agreement that's been ratified by Congress, actually a series of agreements. And also the President of the United States was issuing some of those, and they were ratified then by Congress. Is that yes, correct? yes. In more recent times, in, the, in this century, Congress has passed a number of laws, have they not, that apply to tribes across the country. So in the present science, so those are in, in regular statutes, am I correct? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure I understand your question. There have been you know, dozens of laws that have yeah. been passed in direct relationship with, with tribal, tribal uh, relations, one, tribal laws. One of the laws. things I'm thinking of is the federal law that deals with gambling, for example. Right, IGRA. And, mm -hmm. and, and actually, am I not correct, the federal law said to states, if you do certain things, then tribes have those rights, too, right. in That's, relation to gambling. Yes. Um, the Indian Commerce Clause uh, under the Constitution gives the federal government the right to, to um, preempt, I guess, the, the, the tribal rights, and that's what makes them quasi-sovereign. And one of the ways that they, they deal with individual issues is, is to pass laws. And, and IGRA, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, is one of the ways that they, they govern tribes, and that's for gaming purposes. They, they don't reach into everything, but they do, they do pass laws specifically to, to address certain issues that have become hot topics, I guess. One other question in that area, and that is, if going back in history for some time in the past, if a tribe has a very specific treaty, we're not talking about executive agreements or even statutes of conscience, but they have a specific treaty with the United States, uh, what happens if Congress attempts by legislation without the permission of the tribe to incorporate into statute something that violates the treaty itself? Well, the treaty, the hierarchy of, of laws sure. and the hierarchy of what governs um, relationships with tribes, uh, treaties trump congressional acts. Um, however, you know, the, the power of Congress in, in many ways has been uh, characterized as plenary, meaning it's, it's broad reaching. So if, for example, Congress were to take action that contradicted a treaty, then you know, that would unleash a whole avalanche of effect, and that would be anything from, OK, you're violating a treaty, then they would go back and say, OK, our action is, is not lawful, therefore we won't take it. Or they'd go a different way and say, well, we're perfectly able to do this. It's not either not in violation of the treaty, or we're allowed at this point to violate a treaty, and here's why. You know, so it, it, it's a very complicated question, but hopefully they would just honor the hierarchy of laws and honor the treaty. And secondly, there's a, the other option would be that uh, it might go to court and the court would have to, federal courts would have to settle maybe all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. To correct. Whether the tribe's position was correct if they were supporting the treaty and the Congress was attempting to change it. Hopefully, and you know, there, there have been a whole myriad of cases that treat that kind of action differently. Some have said, well, the treaty didn't exactly speak to that, or some have said, um, this is different, it's been preempted because of X law or whatever, so it's, it's been treated different ways. And, and sometimes the treaty has been upheld as binding, it just depends. A little bit like the Constitution, there's some areas where there'll be a debate over the interpretation. Living document, yeah. Yes, thank you. Janelle Burke.
as Tony noted at the beginning of the show, this is a very complex area. And the relationships are very complex. We've talked a little bit about the relationships between the tribes. We've talked about the relationships of the tribes to the federal government. And what about the relationships of the tribes to the states? Can you explain that to us? I can try. Uh, the relationship between tribes and states uh, have, have, has always been somewhat volatile in some cases. Um, but for the most part, the document that governs that is the United States Constitution again. And under the Constitution, Congress is given the authority to regulate the relations um, between the tribe and the state and also uh, for tribes, on behalf of tribes. And so it, it does not give the states the right to do to regulate tribes, um, to govern tribes. So they're basically on equal footing. Um, they're treated as sovereign nations, just like, like the state is treat treated as a sovereign, so is a tribe. So the relationship um, is, is, should be one that is government to government. Now, again, with 557 tribes, with uh, 50 states, it gets very complicated, and it varies between tr each individual tribe and each individual state. A lot of times, um, the relationship is, is one that's very good, and it's very respectful. And it acknowledges that there are lots of gray areas in jurisdiction and enforcement, um, and that they need to work together to, to um, towards a good neighbor policy and that they have to live within the same boundaries. But I would say it's, it's a one of equality, um, not one or over the other. Now when we talk about Indian country or Indian nation, we are talking about a, a parcel of ground. Is that what we're talking about? Indian country is a definition that's used, it's a term of art, and it means different things in different statutes. Uh, generally, Indian country um, has come to mean any uh, area within a reservation boundary, including you know non non Indian land, um, and also any dependent Indian community. Again, it varies uh, depending on the statute that's used or depending on which which context it's used. But Indian country basically means within reservation boundaries or a dependent Indian community. Are Indian uh, reservation boundaries generally well defined, or are there some instances where it's not altogether clear where the boundary might be? <laughs> Both. Um, a lot of times, the the boundaries are defined, but there may be some discrepancy, or a, a jurisdiction nearby challenges those definitions of the boundary and challenges in court and may or may not win. Um, Indian country can be uh, ambiguous in certain areas, particularly like, for example, in Alaska. That is something that's constantly under litigation, um, and the definition of Indian country can be as broad as anything within Alaska that was once um, Aboriginal territory to just ver very narrowly defined territory. So it's, it's very... Now, how do we get non-Indian lands within Indian country or within a reservation boundary? By virtue of the fact that it's within the reservation boundary, it's by definition Indian country. Um, for example, on the Coeur d'Alene Reservation, the, all the lands within the reservation boundaries are defined as Indian country. Um, sometimes it's not as clear in other cases, but, but usually within reservation boundaries it's Indian country by definition. But there could be some non-Indian yes. land in there. How, how, d how would that have happened? Would the Indians have sold part of the reservation, or would there have been uh, ownerships that date back far in time right. uh, with regard to the ownership of the land? In 1887, there was a, a federal act called the Dawes Act. It's generally known as the General Allotment Act. And what that did was that um, broke up reservations into allotments and of 160 acres each. And what that did was it gave individual tribal members who they deemed eligible, that gave each individual tribal member 160 acres of land. But then with the leftover, of which there was a considerable amount, the federal government deemed that surplus lands um, did not necessarily compensate the tribe or the tribal members for it. And then the remainder was often open for homesteading. Um, for example, in, on the Coeur d'Alene Reservation, that happened between 1905 and 1909. Um, it, took, it took Congress and it took um, federal officials a while to get out here. Um, but when they did it, the surplus lands were homesteaded 
and that means that uh, non-Indians had lands within the reservation boundaries then. And um, so it, it resulted in a checkerboarded effect, and that's what you find on many reservations is that checkerboard, and that's what results in, in the Indian next to non-Indian lands and the resulting jurisdictional um, gray areas. <laughs> I'll follow up on Jamil's question. It's a really fascinating area of yes, law. And that is, the tribe has jurisdiction in many ways in what we call Indian country. And so for those individuals that actually are living within the reservation but have, I, I suppose, deeds to that property, what is different from those individuals and people who own land that's not on the tribe that's privately owned? Do they, they have some certain responsibilities and, and answer the tribe in certain ways? Well, if your question is, if they own an allotment, like a former allotment, that's now non-Indian fee right. simple absolute land. There's a deed to, the, to an individual that's not uh, a member of the tribe. Right. They wouldn't have any different responsibilities than a person who, than a non-Indian who has fee land other than under the Allotment Act. There's no additional responsibility because they've had it for, you know, since the beginning, since the General Allotment Act. The if you're asking the question of jurisdiction, if they have any additional um, duties because they live on a reservation, um, then my answer generally would be, well, yes. I mean, they have another jurisdiction to answer to. They have another regulatory body. They have another um, government to answer to. So that's where the gray area comes in, the state, the tribe. Um, a lot of people see it as, well, you know, I don't want to have to be governed by this body and by this body. I look at it as an opportunity um, to, to live in a different place and to, to be more diverse and to have an opportunity to, to make um, the, the cooperative arrangement work um, between Indian and non-Indian neighbors because they have to live together. But there could be cases in which they would need to obey certain policies of the tribe. Yes. Okay. Yes. I want to go back to the issue that I want to go in a little more depth uh, of the relationship between a tribe and the state okay. which it's in. Uh, Janelle covered some of that in, in, in a very effective way. Uh, but I know we have viewers that have been reading about, in particularly in some areas, I could bring up gambling because it's been the mm -hmm. most uh, publicized, but, and you've indicated in your answer that some states have very good relationships with tribes and states, and other states have a lot of difficulties, and there's, there's been a lot of litigation. Can you give us some more examples of where you talked about that the federal government can come in and be a representative within this process, or oftentimes, if I understand the question, has the power through legislation to say to a state, no, you can't do this to a tribe because right. they have the same relationship with us that you do. Right. In other words, under our federal system of government, in some, some areas of centralization, certain specific powers of the U.S. government, can you give us a couple examples where they can say to states, those things you don't have any jurisdiction over, but we do because of our direct relationship with the tribe. Yes, and it may be, it may be better to clarify some things to some sure. general concepts. Um, federal government has the overall authority to govern relationships um, within states, uh, within tribes and uh, between tribes and states. However, states do and can have some jurisdiction within tribal boundaries if for some reason the federal government has given it to them. Uh, no, let, me for, just, let me get that real clear. If the U.S. government, by law, says to a state, you can do that, yes. then they could. Correct. But if the government of the United States has not done that, then does the state have any power at all in relation to the tribe? Absolutely not. Okay. But in many instances, for example, the, the federal government has done that with okay. states. And, for example, Public Law 280, which was passed in 1953, Idaho is a Public Law 280 state. And that means that Idaho has been granted jurisdiction, um, concurrent jurisdiction with the tribe, um, in some areas, and they're limited areas. Public Law 280, when it was originally passed in 1953, uh, covered only six states, but then later on, I, I believe nine more states were added, of which Idaho was one. For example, uh, the federal government gave Idaho the ability, um, if it wished, uh, partial to, to govern partially in areas like uh, domestic relations, um, mental illness, uh, juvenile delinquency, things like that. And that means that for those in, in cases involving issues related to that, um, the state of Idaho can come in within Indian country and their laws would apply. In those subjects. In those subjects. 
So to answer your question, though, um, where would the federal government say state you can't come in? Examples of that would be um, trust lands, I think is probably the, the most obvious example. And really anything on trust lands, uh, timber resources that the tribe has on trust lands, um, a lot of natural resource issues involving trust lands, basically for almost all practical purposes that I can think of, all purposes I can think of, um, the feds have, the federal government has not granted the state jurisdiction to act in really any way within tribal trust lands. And one other question, we'll probably get back to this on the next show. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're coming back next week. This is so <laughs> fascinating what you're saying. And that is sometimes there is a dispute, and I know the Coeur d'Alene tribe has got a long uh, case going that will last for some time, and that is when you have a situation where you're in uh, a geographical area where we're talking about Indian country and, and about, again, what Janelle said about borders, sometimes there's land that's in dispute. Is that under the jurisdiction, ownership of the tribe, or does the state in which it is located? And we're likely to get more involved in it, I suppose, when it's water, uh, like lakes or rivers and so forth. Uh, can you give us some edification on uh, how that comes up and how we settle that to decide who has supervision of that particular property? I'm not sure I understand your question. Are you asking while it's in dispute who has? Yeah, well, well actually, how we decide who owns it in. I guess I have a two-part question. One is, how did it get in dispute in the first place? And secondly, how do we settle who really owns it or who <laughs> supervises it? That's what I'm basically trying to get at. More than you know, the debate over who will supervise during the time, I'm looking at how we got into the situation and how does it get resolved. Well, I think how we got into the situation is um, a matter of his history. And it's basically just like any other land dispute there were agreements. There's a difference of opinion about whether those agreements were binding, if so, how so, um, or if those agreements have been superseded, um, whether or not the parties agreed to the agreements truly, or if they were coerced, that kind of thing. So it's almost who has the deed to the property? Right. I mean, it, it's, it sounds um, more complicated, I think, than it probably is. It's just a, basically a, a, a dispute as to ownership based on agreements that, that were had a long time ago. Um, as far as like Coeur d'Alene, the dispute arose because of the, the sequence of agreements of when the state of Idaho came into statehood, became, became the state of Idaho, um, when Congress ratified the various agreements, what the federal government was actually agreeing to when it created the reservation, all that came into play. Um, and as you know, the, the federal court decided that, in fact, the federal government reserved that area of the lake for the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And um, that's being appealed. It was so, decided in federal district court. Uh, it was decided in federal district court. Now it'll go before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And so it's, um, it's a matter of Indian law, but it, it could come up between states, for example, or um, with a military reservation or anything of that sort, but, but uh, a lot of it has to do with the timing of agreements and statehood and what was understood or what wasn't understood. And, um, in, in this particular case, it seemed to me uh, Lake Coeur d'Alene was interesting too because after a while, the state of Idaho just sort of started regulating, you know? And if you look at the history, there was no real Lake Coeur d'Alene is yours. <clears throat> they just sort of took it over. And that's obviously my biased opinion. But, um, and, and it's just a matter of when the tribe had the resources and the ability to, to go after what it felt like was always, it, it always belonged to the tribe. The Flathead tribe also had a dispute some years ago on the same right. kind of issue, and, and again in the courts. Uh, when it is finalized in the courts, and that may be before the U.S. Supreme Court, then at that point the issue, when they make their final decision, would, would be final, would it not? Right. And, or if the Supreme Court doesn't hear it, then it's considered final. By the Court of they Appeal. They don't grant certiorari. Yeah. Janelle Burke. Um, I have a series of questions mm -hmm. that possibly you can answer in, in a short period of time. The first one is, who has membership in the tribe? Membership is a, an internal issue, and it's de defined by both the tribal constitution and by the tribal council. So um, who, who has membership of the tribe? That's decided by statute and by constitution, tribal constitution. Um, the basic 
uh, right now there are about 16, a little over 1,600 members of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, um, and I can get more detailed if you like. But that, that's close enough. That's, mm -hmm. That lets us know how that is determined. When the tribe owns land, does it own it as uh, in common, if you will, or do individuals, individual Indian families own property? The or tribe, both. the tri it's usually both. Um, in common, I don't know if that's exactly accurate just because um, that's the way the, the tribe used to own it many, you know, hundreds of years ago and thousands of years ago, but that concept was eradicated and that's when we get the Allotment Act and kind of the more Western way of looking at land ownership. But um, the tribe can own land, so the, the tribe as a whole can own land, and then individual members can own land as well. And um, on the Coeur d'Alene Reservation, land is held both by the tribe and by individual members. And can tribes tax? Yes. Do tribes have the power to tax, to raise revenue, uh, both from Indians and non-Indians? Absolutely. So they can decide, the tribal council can decide, we're going to assess every member. Yes, or and every person on the reservation if they wish. And most tribes do not exercise that ability, but they, they could do it if they wished. And can they also uh, assess non-Indian members who live on the reservation? Yes. So they could tax land, for example, that was non-Indian land that was within the boundary of the reservation. They could, yes. And do tribes have their own schools? Uh, some tribes do, some tribes don't. Tribes don't. Um, the Coeur d'Alene tribe does have a tribal school located in Dismet, and that's open to Indians and non-Indians. Most of the the members, most of the school kids are Indians, on but there are non-Indians there. On that note, I have to bring the program to conclusion. And for our viewers, the good news is that Tara Salisbury Allgood, who is an attorney with the Coeur d'Alene tribe, will be back with us again next week. And Tara, at that time, we're going to discuss uh, some other issues. That we just got into now uh, about what happens to jurisdiction, both courts, the tribal courts, and, and the state courts, and, and other issues that uh, you will be able to enlighten us on, and we really appreciate that very much. And ladies and gentlemen, I know you've enjoyed this program, and we invite you to be with us again next week when we will continue this with our guest dealing with tribal law and history. Uh, until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. by the lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I welcome you back to part two of our two-week series that is entitled Indian law and history. We're so pleased to discuss uh, the tribes in the country and their relationship to the federal government, the state governments, and relationship to one another, and then how uh, on a particular reservation and within a tribe, how the government works in that process. And we just got started last week, and we want to continue with some other issues. And we're so pleased to welcome back to the program Tara Salisbury Allgood, who is an attorney with the Coeur d'Alene tribe. She holds a baccalaureate degree from the University of San Diego in political science, and she has her Doctor of Jurisprudence from the American University College of Law in Washington, D.C. Tara, last week was just such an informative program. We're pleased to have you back again this week. Thank you. And as always, I'm pleased to have regular panelist Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho, which gives her really great credentials to deal with this subject, as well as others, and I shall ask Janelle to commence today's questioning. 
Tara, it's a great pleasure to talk with you again about this subject. Uh, Indian law is a very specialized area, but it's one that affects a lot of people, and particularly in our viewing, viewing audience area. Um, can you tell us something about how the, the tribal government is formed? Tribal government is formed under its own constitution, which was approved by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, in the case of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, it was approved in, in 1947. It, it structures the tribal government um, to have a tribal council that makes all the legislative decisions and uh, makes the laws for the tribe. It's a representative democracy. They're elected by the tribal members, and there are seven elected officials uh, every year as the seven are, are either the, the staggered ones who are then elected in, um, they re-vote for who's the chairman, who's the vice chairman, and, who, and who's the secretary treasurer. That's the basic uh, structure of the tribal council. And then there's also the, the tribal court as the, the, the uh, interpreter, and then we also have the, the enforcement body. But that's, that's basically the tribal council as well, and they do it through arms of the tribal government, meaning the, the police um, and, and departments like that. Is there a chief? No, there's not a chief anymore. It's, it's a chairman. Um, so uh, um, I think there are very few tribes that still have chiefs that designate their leader as chief. When they have a chairman, what are his powers and his responsibilities? The powers of the chairman are basically to carry out the will of the tribal council um, as representing the, the tribal membership. And he is, he is designated as the, the person to represent the tribe the person to make sure the laws are, are carried out and to meet on a government-to-government -government basis with uh, federal government officials, state officials, things like that. Can he make decisions on his own, he or she, uh, or do, do those decisions have to be ratified by the council? Well, it depends on the, the nature of the decision. Um, major decisions are subject to tribal council approval. And I think as a, a matter of course, they, you know, the chairman basically like to get ratification. But um, in, in issues that he's, he's already gotten, or she, but in, in the case of the Coraline tribe, uh, he, um, in cases that he's already gotten approval to move forward on a particular issue, then he may not require additional ratification for his decision. Does the tribal chairman have staff members? Yes. Um, in the case of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, uh, the tribal chairman ha has um, several staff members that work for him. Um, he has an executive assistant and, you know, the vice chairman is there to help him as well. Um, it varies from tribe to tribe. It depends on resources. It, it, it depends on the, the draw of the, I guess, the demand that's placed on the chairman. Um, for example, some tribal councils, the entire body is, is paid. Um, in the case of the, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, the tribal chairman is the only position that's a full-time paid position. The rest of the council members have other jobs, so it, it, it's going to depend. Who drafts the budget or who proposes mm -hmm. the budget? And uh, is there a chief financial officer of some type? In the case of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, there is a chief financial officer. His name is David McDowell. And um, as far as who drafts the budget, all of the staff play a role in drafting the budget, and it, it kind of goes through the same process as any, any major budget, and that is staff needs are outlined, uh, resources are delineated, what, what's doable, what's not doable, um, and it goes through several processes, including um, we have a finance committee that our budget proposals go through, and then ultimately it's, it's subject to council approval. And you also have departments that would deal with like social welfare issues, I would take it. Um, what are some of the major departments? And would those be similar in other tribes? The Coeur d'Alene tribe has several departments, Natural Resource Department, Department of Education, uh, Social Service Department. Um, it has a police department under uh, what we call the, the Justice Center, the, and that's tribal court um, and police, law and order administrator, public defender, prosecutor. Um, and as far as whether or not that's similar in other tribes, yes, usually it is. It, it depends on what the tribe has taken on, what it's contracted out from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to uh, be responsible for. Um, the Coeur d'Alene tribe has uh, several major departments. 
Um, and the, the department is, hu- I mean, the, the tribal administration is huge, uh, including the, the gaming enterprise. We have over 600, I believe, employees. So it's, it's a major undertaking. I want to expand it somewhat, and, and you refer to that as you've talked about the Coraline tribe, but we indicate on the first show there are 557 uh, tribes in the country recognized by the government of the United States. Uh, and of that population, am I correct, there's about 2.3 million uh, members of tribes around the country? I believe so, yes. yes. And that would mean also that some tribes would be larger in population than others, and therefore the demands of the government would be greater than some others. So just a series of, I guess, again, somewhat short questions, but when you indicated that the council is chosen by the members of the tribe, is that common through all tribes, or are there some difference in the selection process around the country? I can't say for all tribes, but for, for all the tribes I know of, um, that's the usual course of business. The, the elected officials are usually um, in charge of the tribe, and they are you know, elected to be a part of a representative democracy. So, My second question has to do with, you explained the role of the council and then the different departments and all. Again, do you have pretty much a common distinction between uh, the, the policy making, the legislative, and the executive administering it, and then the court system? Let me, let me do a footnote here. One thing that I don't think we've done in this country is we've given great praise to people like James Madison for the creation within the U.S. Constitution of separation of powers between the Congress and the President, executive branch, and the federal courts. But it's my understanding that Ben Franklin, in particular, and others who observed this, that this was really um, a concept that was taken from tribes in this country. Uh, so uh, can you give us a little more uh, indication that it's a very, very old concept, and it's really worked well with uh, the government of the United States, and also states are also based on this. I- is that common, too, among tribes? Uh, the Eastern tribes, in particular, uh, back in the 1700s, were already doing this, and we, the founding authors of our government uh, learned from them. Well, um, a lot of the tribes that I've had dealings with or learned about basically have structures that their, their tribal council serves as the legislature and then also um, as, as sort of the enforcement body. Now, they delegate that enforcement power to the police um, or sometimes the Bureau of Indian Affairs is still in charge of, of some form of informant, enforcement like the police. And then the tribal courts are often separate. Um, it's n- so it's not a perfect form of three tiers. Right. More um, overseeing by the legislature. Right, right. Um, there are some tribes that do not have tribal courts. There are some tribes that do not have their own law enforcement services. If they don't, then is all that taken care of by state courts? It, it, it depends. Some are contracted out. Um, okay. Some services are contracted out with state courts. Um, sometimes there's a, there's a gap there. N- no court really services them, so they, they need to find a forum. Um, and that's usually by default some state court somewhere that, that may be not convenient. Um, but to answer your question, I guess, uh, basically, at least in my experience, the the tribal council serves as you know the the lawmaker and at least a supervisory authority over the law enforcer. Another area we want to get into, and this is a, a real interest, and that has to do with the, the courts. I'm zeroing in on the courts now, mm-hmm. and cases. <clears throat> there are numbers of cases you indicate that go to the tribal courts for decision, with both councils, both prosecution and defense there. Other cases go to state court, and mm-hmm. other cases go to federal court. So, would you just walk us through those three and the, some examples of cases uh, in in various tribes would go to which of those three courts? Okay, I'll try to do this uh, as basically as I can. It's a very complicated yes. area. Um, for the most part, state courts do not have jurisdiction over Indians within Indian country. Um, so, th- those cases would go to tribal court. Um, Generally, federal courts have jurisdiction in two areas, and that is federal question jurisdiction um, to answer issues that are, are under federal, federal laws um, that are in controversy, and then diversity jurisdiction, where there are two people or two entities that are of different jurisdictions. Um, in the tribal context, what ends up happening is um, if there is a federal question uh, but there are tribal members involved or tribal issues involved, 
then it would go to tribal court first for exhaustion of tribal remedies and then potentially be reviewed by federal court. Um, state court jurisdiction would, would also potentially come into play where you have an Indian off-reservation. Anything off-reservation generally uh, goes to state court. For, you know, you have a whole different area for criminal um, right. and then criminal jurisdiction within Indian country is very complicated. Uh, in some, basically, if it's an Indian offender um, or an alleged offender, then that would, if it's a misdemeanor, would go to tribal court. If it's a felony under the Major Crimes Act, it would go to federal court um, and with the FBI having jurisdiction. But again, because of Public Law 280, that sometimes gets um, gray, it gets uh, mired down, in, in, and sometimes those cases can go to state court depending on um, who decides to prosecute and how cooperative the effort is between either the FBI and the tribal police and the state, or if there is cooperation or, or not. Um, with civil cases, it, it depends on who the plaintiff is, who the defendant is, um, or respondent, um, and what the issue is. For Coeur d'Alene Tribal Court, for example, the standard for jurisdiction is um, if the incident occurs within the reservation boundaries, and this is paraphrasing, but if the incident occurs within reservation boundaries or it has some sort of effect on the Coeur d'Alene tribe or reservation community. And so you get into an analysis of personal jurisdiction and then also subject matter jurisdiction. So each case has to go through, you know, does tribal court have personal jurisdiction? If so, then does tribal court have subject matter jurisdiction? And at that point, the tribal court would take the case. If it doesn't, then it would arguably go to state court. And some of that complex discussion talk about would be uh, uh, crafted in federal legislation and uh, have been passed. Uh, particularly, I'm thinking, would, would some of that be in federal legislation concerning like felonies go to federal court or certain kinds, or that certain jurisdiction was granted to the states with agreement of the tribe? Would that be correct observation? Um, very little has been clarified by federal okay. legislation. Um, more has been clarified by, I would say, federal common law, which obviously the state um, and the tribe, tribal state courts and the tribal courts should defer to that interpretation of of which which cases should go where. Um, and to my knowledge and in practice, I believe both tend to defer to like the Supreme Court interpretation of what cases uh, tribal court should in entertain versus what it shouldn't. Um, same thing with state courts. Mistakes are made all the time. You, you, you hear about cases that went up through state court system that should have never been there, um, and sometimes tri tribal courts that maybe should not have been there. Um, so it's a very complicated case-by-case -case analysis. Um, but I would say criminal law is really the only area that clarification has been made about which courts are the right courts. And even then, with the clarification, it's sometimes no, it should be in tribal court, no, it should be in state court. But, but the criminal law is more clearly defined than the civil cases, um, For some purposes, yes, mm -hmm. I'd say. It's still complicated, um, and it's, it's still somewhat messy, but I'd say, yeah. One final question before I go back to Janelle, and that has, are the cases, uh, uh, rare cases, I would assume, where maybe no one would take jurisdiction, no one's sure? Uh, does oh, sure. ever a case fall through the cracks? Sure, um, but I'd say, you know, relatively rarely. Okay. And those are usually cases that involve sovereign immunity, whether right. you know a state is involved, tribe is involved, fed, federal government's involved, um, but I'd say rarely. Janelle Bird. I want to ask about the structure of the court system, the tribal court system. What is the structure? The structure of the tribal court is um, the trial level. There are, there are two tiers, the trial level and the appellate level. At the trial level, um, it's there are two types of judges allowed at Coeur d'Alene Tribal Court. One is called a, a general judge and one is called a special judge. Um, one is required to be um, lawyer trained to be an attorney. The other one is it's more flexible and they are required to be uh, a member of a federally recognized tribe, um, required to have training but not be a, a lawyer per se. And then um, 
in addition to that, there are, there are what we call um, peacemaker mediations. Um, that's something that's in the formative stages, at least at Coeur d'Alene Tribal Court. And that's a potential uh, conflict resolution forum in, prior to, to trial. Most uh, tribal courts that I know of are two tiers, their trial and then appellate. And then at that point, um, you would consider whether or not to appeal to federal court for review. And the appellate court is uh, composed of how many members? Um, the appellate court is, is <coughs> sort of a roving court. And when somebody appeals a tribal court decision, then we actually call in special judges. Um, so it, 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 it varies. It may be um, a special judge from another tribal court, or we may ask a federal judge to sit um, who's had tribal court experience. Um, so it, it depends on the need. Is there a jury system, a peer system of review? There is a jury system. Um, it's not used very much because it's used uh, at the request of the defendant, and uh, more often than not, they don't request a jury trial. And um, as far as peer review, the only peer review that goes on is probably through the peacemaker process. And again, that's in the formative stages, so that's, that's um, undetermined at this time, you know, whether or not people want to instill that kind of community input in that peacemaker process. Now, that you indicated that the tribal, co uh, tribal council um, enacts certain, do they call them ordinances? What are, the, what, what are the rules called? Um, what we would call statutes, ordinances? Under the tribal constitution, they're referred to as ordinances. Um, in my legal opinion, that's a misnomer because an ordinance is usually passed by a municipality, um, a local governing body. And why the Bureau of Indian Affairs picked ordinance as the name, you know, in 1934, I have no idea. But uh, they, they enact laws. Sometimes they're called ordinances, or sometimes they're just called laws. <laughs> the laws that they enact, the ordinances, uh, uh, let's say, for example, it could be a fishing ordinance that, that prohibited certain activities, um, limited the, the fishing activity. Um, would they then also have a, some kind of a penalty that would be attached to that ordinance? It would usually be a, a civil penalty. Um, In other words, what I'm getting at is, is the penalty the same on, in the tribal court as it is in the state court, or is there a separate system of penalty? The tribe has the ability to make a completely separate system of penalty, and um, in most cases it's usually slightly different. A lot of times, you know, the, the tribe will try to enact something very similar to the state um, just for equity and, and, and for practical reasons, um, but the tribe has the ability to do something completely different. Um, and uh, but again, it's usually very, very equivalent, something very similar. Mine goes back to the 1980s when there was a question of reapportionment in the state of Idaho, mm -hmm. and, and the tribe was deeply interested in the plans, and uh, the plan that had been adopted by the state was dividing the land. Uh, most of the members of the tribe were in one legislative district, and, and a lot of the land was in a different district. And I remember the late Henry Sijon, and his eloquent testimony was saying, when, when asked the question, well, why does this matter? Because the population is one legislative district. And he said, you don't understand. We don't divide our people from the land. And from that and other examples I have seen, there is a great appreciation of nature and the land and the, and the sacredness to some uh, locations. Uh, based on that uh, background, would you share with us how tribes, not only the Coeur d'Alene tribe, but tribes all throughout the country, uh, view land and, and its importance to their history somewhat different than other populations? Well, I don't know if I could do that question justice, um, but in working with tribes and tribal members, it's, it's um, a relation, the relationship between the land and the tribe and the tribal members is something that's very special, something that, that um, goes back in, in time and that they relate to in a way that I don't know if I could articulate the attachment to the resources and the attachment to the land is something that for them has always been a part of their lives and has always been a part of their reality. It's not about um, moving around the country and experiencing life. It's about being close to home, being close to the land, um, 
they can remember when their grandfather was telling them stories about, you know, the hill and what that hill meant to the history of the tribe and how the tribal members met there for ceremonies. And it's amazing even now working with tribal members, um, you'll ask them where something is, is located and they'll say, oh, well, the hill where um, th this gathering was all the time. And you find out that that gathering hasn't been held for 50 years, but that's still how they refer to the area. So I think the relationship is something that's so integral to everything that they are that um, everything comes back to it. The roots are very deep. The roots are very deep. Whereas with some uh, societies, moving around is, mm -hmm. uh, is more common. Right. Uh, one footnote here, where North Idaho College sits on the lake of Coeur d'Alene, this was uh, the gathering place for the Coeur d'Alene tribe and three other tribes, I believe, twice a year. And when the beach here was dedicated to the Coeur d'Alene tribe, the tribe named it uh, Yup Canum, which means the gathering place. And so that, that's a footnote. Mm -hmm. uh, one other question, then I'll go back to Janelle. And that has to do with, in relation to uh, not only the concept of nature and the land, but there's a very, uh, which I think has a tie to, if I understand, the government and to law and to policy, and, and how they perceive the relationship to states and national government. There is a very strong tie to, to their concept of spirituality. Could you just briefly address how that, I'm sure with your work in law and all, how it fits in uh, as, as they're passing laws and, and addressing certain concepts, that their concept of, of religion and spirituality is, is very woven in, the, in public policy, is it not? Yes, and I think it, it's different for every tribe. Yes. And the degree is different for every tribe. Um, but I think one way that they acknowledge that um, relationship is, for example, in, in the code, um, judges are to look to tribal law and then tribal custom and practice. And they may ask a, a tribal member to come in and testify as to what the custom and practice is um, before a decision can be made. Um, and I think that you, you see that uh, in practice every day in taking into account certain um, laws that have been drafted, you know, it, it has an impact on the daily life and, and the spirituality of, of tribal members. So they'll come in and, and speak to the tribal council about how they may impact the laws may impact um, certain practices or, or certain ways of life, and, and that that definitely sways the tribal council's um, decisions. For sure. Based on that view, is it uh, possible that? what we call in the other circles is common law, and the English law was, law was common law, and, and uh, in this country we got to put an awful lot of that into written statutes. Are tribes more likely to yield to common law and custom tradition without even placing certain things in written statutes, but continue to follow the custom? Definitely, and, and the other part of that is that people have differences of opinion, even tribal members, mm -hmm. about what was customary. And so the, the, it may be that all that needs to be taken into account. And so to, to try to reduce it to writing would be difficult, if not impossible, and then may not do it justice, may not be accurate enough to put it down in writing. So they'd rather just speak to it. That would certainly explain the role of elders in, uh, mm -hmm, in the definitely, tribe. Definitely. Janelle Berg. I have a short series of questions. Uh, the first one, in our normal court systems, or in our usual court systems, we have rules of procedure and rules of evidence. Are there rules of procedure and rules of evidence that are applied in the, in, in the tribal courts? Yes, there are. And then in the Coeur d'Alene tribal case, at least, it's basically modeled after the federal rules of civil procedure. And who can appear? You know, you, lawyers have to be members of the mm -hmm. bar in order to appear before the Idaho State Courts, for example. Right. Who can appear in the Indian tribal courts? You need to be admitted into tribal courts, usually. Um, most tribal courts, it's just a matter of submitting a request to be admitted and then maybe paying a nominal fee anywhere from 10 to 25 to 50 dollars, if that. Um, some courts have, some tribal courts um, have their own bar. They make you take a test. Um, Navajo Nation, for example, has a bar exam, and I've heard it's actually very difficult that you need to sit for before you can go to Navajo Nation and, and appear as an attorney. Um, I know, I think Colville has a, a brief test and most of it's oral, um, I think. But, um, so it varies from tribe to tribe. You just need to call the tribal court and see how to get admitted. Are family matters heard in the tribal courts? Yes, family matters. So you matters. can get a divorce in the, in the tribal court? Yes. 
And what about adoption matters? Adoption matters can be heard in tribal court, um, and especially for tribal members. We're talking now about adoption of Indian children. Right, right. Adoptions can be heard in tribal court. If you're asking about adoptions of Indian children into non-Indian families, yes. it's going to depend on where the non-Indian family is located and also if they've complied with the Indian Child Welfare Act and, and all the federal government regulations and such. We're just running out of time, but if it was a non-Indian child being adopted, then you go through the other court system, I would assume. It depends where it is, but m more than likely it's going to be off reservation um, if it's into a non-Indian family, I'd say. And and then it's you know potentially being state court. On that note, we have to bring the program to conclusion. On behalf of Janelle Burke and our staff, uh, Tara Salisbury, all good. I want to thank you for the two weeks you spent with us. It's been extremely informative and helpful to us to understand an important issue, and that issue has been Indian law and history. And we'd like to have you back next year, and we can <laughs> pursue some areas that we did not get to pursue today. But thank you for being with us. We greatly appreciate thank it. You. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you found our program most informative on Indian law and history over the last uh, two weeks. We've been very pleased to bring it to you. And I would like to invite you to be with us again next week at this same time when we shall s discuss another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.